So if you need to, just press that button and type it in. I'll keep my eye on that as we move forward. Okay, we can keep going. <laughs> so Bob Bosca, Bosca is an agency put together. It represents a 26 agencies, that include cities, water districts, a water company, and a university that, that purchased water wholesale from the San Francisco Regional Water System. The Bosca member agencies provide water to almost 2 million people and over 40,000 businesses and community organizations in Alameda, Santa Clara, and San Mateo County. Bosca's goal is a high quality supply of water at a fair price. Go ahead. So Bosca offers these classes because they know that outdoor water use is the single largest opportunity for water conservation in the uh, Bosca service area and outdoor water use reduction through the use of water efficient plants and innovative techniques can help conserve water and ensure that future water supply needs of our communities are met. And having worked for a Bosca agency during the drought, it really was amazing how well everyone did to cut back and reduce their water when we were in that drought a few years ago. Go ahead. So Brisbane, if any Brisbane residents are on the line, if you need some additional ways to save, we have um, uh, participate with Bosca on some of these rebate programs. So on the right side, you'll see the rain barrels. So we offer a hundred dollar rebate if you install a rain barrel and information, you can find that information through Bosca or you can contact the Brisbane Public Works Department. And again, my name's Bob Sage and I can help get you in touch with that or uh, Bob Sage at brisbaneca.org. And we also have a Lawn Be Gone program and that's for people who take out their grass lawns and put in, you know, some drought tolerant or, um, you know, water conservative landscaping instead of a lawn. We can go ahead. So if you like tonight's class, we have a few more coming up in the near future. Um, you can see them there on the left, drought tolerant habitat gardens, water efficient organic edible gardening, attracting good bugs to your garden, secrets to successful succulents, summer landscaping essentials, and natural pest deterrents. And so go ahead and register now for any of those you want, and it should be similar to the link you used to register tonight. I'm ready. And the, another website you can check is bayareagardening.org. It tells you how to turn your thirsty lawn into a not so thirsty lawn. Mm -hmm. And and now is it okay so i'm going to tell you a little bit about jennifer before she takes over so jennifer alstrand is the owner of west wind succulents she's lived in the bay area her whole life after studying painting and sculpture at the california college of arts in oakland she worked at macy's in san francisco doing window displays for seven years she started growing succulents on a windy rooftop in west oakland and she found herself only wanting to be with her plants she began using succulents as her artistic medium, which inspired her to create West Wind Succulents in 2017. Her plants are now grown in her Lafayette um, nursery and used in eco-friendly succulent decor for weddings, special events, custom arrangements, and small-scale landscape design. She teaches workshops and classes on crafting with succulents, propagation, and plant care. And she's going to teach us tonight. So thank you very much. And I'm turning it over to Jennifer. and. I'm excited. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm so excited because I love succulents, obviously, but the propagation is probably one of my favorite parts about them. It's why I became so obsessed with them um, because all of a sudden I was able to have a million of them. And um, yeah, so I figured out how to make them be my new art form. So I'm pretty happy about it. I'm actually in my nursery in Lafayette right now. You can kind of see a little bit of it. Um, and so I'm going to cover these topics, um, propagating techniques. Uh, the most common are dividing, uh, pups, cuttings, beheading, and leaves. Um, and let's see. Oops. Sorry about that, <laughs> not used to these buttons. Um, and then we're gonna talk some about um, what your succulent is telling you. So things like light, water, soil, 
repotting, and pests. Okay, so um, I get excited about stuff. So if I get off topic or start going off on something, um, please forgive me and definitely feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm going to try to every 10 minutes or so um, stop and pause for questions and Bob will field them and like he said and then pass them to me. So feel free and then if there's anything that we don't get to we will have a question and answer at the end and you can also email me. Um, I'm not sure if my uh, hopefully my website is showing up on as my name on there too. So okay so oops my goodness. Okay, so dividing um, is a really common way of, of, of propagating succulents. Um, anything that has a pup will be able to be divided. Um, I actually have some examples right here of aloe like this that I just thought I would show in person. So the best way to do this is by gently pulling them apart from the base and trying to take as many of the roots with them as possible, like this. Like this one had a good root, Whereas some of these other ones didn't really have a root at all. Um, and that's okay. Those, were, those will still grow. And what I would do with these to prep them to uh, propagate is I would just pull off some of the bottom leaves like that and expose a little more area for root to grow. And then you could plant these in cutting trays, which I'll show you uh, in a few more slides. Um, let's see. So not everything will pup right? Like some plants don't. There's a lot of um, echeverias that are very hybridized and like specialized and they tend to not reproduce as, as fast or if, if at all as some others. Um, some of them will have their own root systems and some of them won't. Um, things that tend to be, uh, pups that tend to be closer to soil will generally have roots and ones that um, pup up higher usually won't. Um, these calancho are called lavender scallops. Um, they're awesome. They will actually root themselves into the air when they're not happy. Um, sometimes it'll happen when they're, they look perfectly healthy. They'll look like the happy one on the left and you'll still see some rooting happening. But generally, if there's a lot of roots like the one on the right, they will, it's a sign that it's not doing well. It's not getting enough water. It's like really struggling and trying to grow. Um, uh, Bob, actually, can you bear with me one second? I'm gonna, I gotta run and grab something that I forgot to put in front of me, like, like a silly person. So one sec, I'll be right back. Okay, sounds good. All right, so if anyone else just joining us, we just getting started and Jennifer will be right back. Okay. <laughs> there she is. Realize I might need my notes. Uh, generally, uh, I can just talk for hours about everything, but gotta gotta keep myself focused so that I'm we're not here all night. <laughs> Sounds good. And don't okay. forget, everybody, you can type a question in at the Q and A, and we'll bring it up if you if it's uh, appropriate. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, another thing I'll mention about the pups is when you remove them, like I said, try to grab as close to the base as possible when you're re removing them. Sometimes you'll get roots, sometimes you won't. Don't worry too much about breaking the roots off. Um, that's, again, something why, the reason why succulents are so good for beginners is that they're so forgiving. Um, I have been known to, when I'm doing some of my arrangements, I will actually, like, I really want something to fit in a pot. It's the perfect shape and size, but the root ball is too big, and I will rip half of it off and plant it anyway and it doesn't care and it's totally fine and it grows on to be a happy healthy plant. So you really can manipulate them quite a bit so don't be freaked out. I mean some are more delicate than others but for the most part they're all going they, they want to live so they're gonna they're gonna do their darndest. Um, here's another example of uh, pups that are all called seedlings also. They will grow on the edges of plants uh, not all plants do this, but this is a good example. A lot of colanchos do this. This one's a super cool one. I think this is also referred to as uh, alligator plant. It's the uh, is the common name for this. Um, but see, they'll they'll pup right on the ends. They'll have seedlings right on the ends of those leaves, and then those leaves will actually drop down, 
and I don't know if you can see this picture isn't the best, but right here, that is one of the seedlings that has dropped down and begun to grow, which is super cool. Um, there's other ones. I don't know if you've seen those super purple ones that are referred to as mother of millions, but also that um, this concho uh, lavender scallops that will, I think some people call this butterfly plant as well, because it will have little edge seedlings that are pink and looks kind of like butterflies. So it's super awesome. And I've even had some plants that, I, that I've had for two or three years that I didn't know reproduce that way. And then all of a sudden they'll have little seedlings that drop. So succulents can surprise you. It's fun to learn about each one. They're all very different. And depending on their age or their conditions um, or their stress level, they will kind of create different ways to reproduce. So cuttings, this is my absolute favorite way. This is my number one way to propagate succulents. You'll see on the right, these are, these are actually um, like little cutting buckets that I've created because I started selling little cutting grab bags on my website. So people can kind of get like a nice little starter kit of a bunch of different things and practice uh, propagating themselves. You can also trade with your neighbor, a lot of times people will post cuttings on Craigslist, so that's a good way to get them. Um, basically anything that you can cut a fully formed piece of the plant off, you can propagate with a cutting. Um, this one on this picture on the left I have here to show you of uh, one that I love and I was so excited to have this big, what I call a mother plant. So it's what I make my babies from. And it was nice and full and thick. And so what I did is I went in there and I, took about a third out. I just kind of thinned it out all over just to keep the plant looking nice, to keep it balanced. Um, another benefit to spreading out where you take cuttings from is you'll, you'll start to give light to plant, to part of the plant that didn't get as much light before, right? So like if I were to pull that apart, I'd see down in there, there were some little, little sprouts coming up. And if I thin that out, then all of a sudden those little sprouts are gonna have access to more light and they're gonna just get big and go on and that plant will return to this size in a few months, in six months, depending on the time of year and the growing, the growth, the growth rate and the conditions that they're in. Um, so these are how I do my cutting trays. They're really fun. You can do them all the same, but I usually, um, doing a bunch of different things at once. So I just mix them all together, which is totally fine. Um, so the soil that I use for this, we'll talk more about that later as well, but I use perlite and I mix that into the soil to make it nice and well draining and lightweight. I like these, this is what this is. It's kind of hard to tell, but what this is, is one of those plastic nursery trays and I line the bottom with shade cloth, burlap, something to keep the soil from falling through. And then I fill that with my succulent soil, perlite blend. And then I just stick them in, kind of secure them down so that they don't flop over. You wanna give yourself a good stem so that, let's see, I'm just gonna reach over here and break something up and show you. <laughs> this is a little, um, Called, it's a Tradescantia called Greenly. It's similar to, you probably have seen that purple heart used in landscape a lot. This is like a smaller, cute version. I just broke this off. I took away the dead leaves. This is a, probably a good size stem and I would plant it just like this so that it doesn't flop over. You don't wanna have something with a really tall, long stem, plant it here and then have it fall over. So you want it well weighted and secure when you plant it. If you're planting something that you're finding you're having a hard time them kind of flopping over, you can get your soil a little bit damp so it's a little heavier and that will help with that too. Um, oh, and an important thing about when you do your cuttings also is you want to, I'm sure many of you have heard this, you want to let them harden off. Um, when I first started doing this, I was not super religious about doing that. Um, and I still had, good success, but now that I know why, I think it is a really good idea to be patient and let them harden off. So what hardening off means is this one that I just cut, for example, I'm gonna leave this for 
anywhere from like 24 to 48 hours to let this have a callus. It's going to harden off. It'll basically, instead of being this wet, fleshy stem, it's going to be dry and have like a nice little skin on it. It's, I think of it basically like a scab, you know, like you get cut and we get scabs to protect any um, infection and bacteria from getting in. And it's the exact same thing with these. This, that's why you want to wait so that when you plant it, it's going to be less prone to rotting and less prone to any funky stuff that may enter the soil from entering into the succulent itself. Um, and then what else do we want to say about that? Oh, so the, for the cutting trays too, you'll notice that I have them crammed in there pretty tight. That's totally fine. As long as they all have access to a good amount of sun, that is great. Um, what you don't want to do is have, say, like a big, a big huge cutting up here and then little ones down below that's blocking the light of the babies underneath it, right? So kind of keep them all the same height. Um, another thing to keep in mind, if there's things that are more prone to rotting that are maybe slower growing, slower to root, which is all stuff that you kind of learn by trial and error um, or by looking it up, but like Whenever I propagate these little aloe, these I've noticed tend to root more slowly and therefore kind of rot a little more quickly. So what I would do with these is I would plant them on the edges of my cutting trays because your edges of your any container are going to be the things that dry out first. So keep that in mind. And that will set you up for success. Speaking uh, of drying out, Jennifer, we have a question regarding watering. Yes shoot and how how often do you need to water and we have another one about um how long can it harden off before you plant it can it go more than the 24 to 48 hours very good question yes it can um you can it can be weeks if need be um so the thing you want to do is when you're letting them harden off is you want to keep them in a place that's out of direct sun but that still gets nice, good airflow and keep it dry. And things that have a thicker stem, so like this one would probably only take 24 to 48 hours. You could wait longer. The only risk in that is it's just gonna, you'll notice it's just gonna start to like dry out a little bit more. It might get a little sad. It'll start to lose moisture the longer you wait. So the risk you run with that is that once you go to stick it, it's just not gonna be as healthy of a plant to start with. So it might, it'll struggle more and you'll have more chance that it won't successfully root and grow. Um, when you do, I'm going to get to this a little bit after this, but um, when you do thicker things, the, the stem can take anywhere from like, it could take like a week to harden off. So if you're doing something like a big cactus or some really big plant that has like a big thick stem, I'm like trying to, I can't lift anything that has a big enough stem, but anything with a big stem, you're, you're gonna wait. So just look at it is the best rule of thumb. Look at it to see and make sure it's dry. Hopefully that, does that answer it? Um, and then watering. Yeah, that seemed to answer it. And then the other one, so. Oh, I lost you. But the other one was about watering these. And um, I water these similarly to how I water other succulents, which is about once a week, but only when the soil is completely dry. So if that happens to be longer than once a week, so be it. But always make sure the soil is dry, both with the cuttings and with full grown pots. Oh, Bob, it looks like you are muted. If there was another one, but. Um, oh yeah, so the other one was um, putting them in water to let them root versus putting them in soil. Yes, that is a really good question. And that is actually something that I don't have a bunch of experience with. I. I've done it with a few things because I've heard other people have done it successfully and it, it blows my mind only because succulents don't generally like water, right? Like they're prone to, to rotting. So my answer to that would be try it. My answer to everything is try it basically. <laughs> um, that's, that's the thing with succulents is if you're not sure, try it. The worst that's going to happen is it's going to die, which sounds brutal. But, you know, so maybe don't experiment on your like prized Echeveria that's like two foot in diameter, but generally just like try. So, yeah. 
um, so the another one that's really related to this is the grow tray mandatory or can the starter plants be planted directly into the ground? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you, you can do that. I have not done that. I would suggest if you can, I would grow them in a tray or a shallow container of some sort. You can do it in a big pot, um, but shallow is best only because it dries out more quickly, right? So the thing that you want to achieve with these is you want them to dry out quickly, especially when they're little babies, because they're just more delicate than full grown plants, right? So they're like, think of them actually like babies. You're, so you're not going to put them in full sun. You're definitely going to keep them in a, like a filtered light situation or like sheltered next to something where they're not getting hours and hours of direct sun. I would say probably no direct sun if you can handle it. But, um, but yeah, these are, these are delicate little babies. So you kind of want to, you want to watch them closely. So that's why I would say you can do it in the ground. Just make sure if you're going to do it in the ground, just make sure your soil is super nice and loose. So that's something that I'm going to get to when we get to soil is the perlite. That's what perlite is so great because it keeps the, um, it keeps the soil from compacting too much and it makes it easier for you to shoot roots out into. So, so I would say if you had like really clay dense soil, don't put them just in that. Amend the soil, get the soil nice and loose so it can actually push roots out easily. Um, okay. Does that answer? Oh, uh, yeah, and we have some more questions, but I think we'll let you get going a little okay. more and see if you answer them before. Right, okay, yeah, I might, I might get to them. Hopefully I will. <laughs> um, so this, this image on the right, I don't know if you can see that, but I, have, I, I like to date my cutting tray. So this one says from March 12th. So that is a little over, so yeah, like two and a half months. And look how big those roots are on that aeonium. So it, it, they root fast, especially now in the, with the weather being warm. It's, so it's really exciting. And they're all gonna root at different speeds too. So it just depends on the, the plant and how, what, how fast of a grower it is. And so I would recommend just mostly cause it's fun and to just keep track. Uh, is to date your cuttings just to see. Um, so what that's what I would recommend too. If like if you wanted to put them in the ground, this is just like a good way to kind of like do it and then see that they have a nice healthy root, root system before you put them in the ground, right? But anyway, so if you're going to tag it, I would also recommend putting two tags with the date in there because I've definitely had a tag fall out and then I'm like, dang it, when did I plant this? And it just, it's something to, you know, to note, then, then you'll start to learn like which things root faster than others. Um, and the way to check the roots is to simply just kind of like gently stick your finger in there and kind of like excavate little ones and see how big the root system is. I would say this plant is definitely ready to be put into a pot. If they still have little teeny delicate roots, I would say let them be in here for a little while. Don't disturb them. Let them get nice and big and strong like more like that size um let's see oh yeah that's something else i wanted to mention too is if you take a cutting of something that's flowering sounds sad but you're gonna want to cut that flower off and the reason is is the plant is giving a lot of energy to keeping that flower alive so you want all of the plant's energy to go to the roots so snip that off put it in a vase enjoy it but that's a, a better plan to, to have them root more successfully. Um, some of them won't make it. That's totally normal. I would like expect a few to die if you're doing like a big amount like this. I usually lose like two or three, um, just for whatever reason, nature, you know. Um, they weren't meant for this world. <laughs> That's what I like to say. <laughs> like, oh, you, you weren't meant, you weren't meant to, to live. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe next time. Um, okay. On to the next slide. So this is what I was talking about before with your soil. So I like to make my own cactus mix and that's mostly because I'm repotting so much and working on a larger scale that I, uh, it's, it's more cost effective and I can control the dryness and the, the density of, of the mix. So the ratios of the mix. So, um, oh, this didn't, this got switched. Anyway, this is labeled wrong, so I'm sorry. So this bag right here is, is perlite. 
not pumice. Pumice is this one. So sorry for that little typo. Um, so perlite, I actually buy at Home Depot. It's, uh, you, could, you could dig around online, um, but that bag is pretty big and it's like $17 last me a decent amount of time. So um, that would be a good investment if you really want to start doing cuttings. So what pumice or what perlite actually is, is super heated pumice. So it's like, it's like popcorn. It's like pumice popcorn. I was really shocked to learn about it, that it was a natural substance because it feels just like styrofoam. And I only use this for my cuttings, my cutting trays, um, for two reasons. Well, a few reasons. One is that, like I mentioned a minute ago, it keeps the soil super lightweight. I mean, this whole bag is like two pounds at the most. It is, it's crazy how lightweight it is. Um, so it just keeps the soil nice and loose. And so those little teeny babies can shoot out little teeny delicate roots really super easily. Um, also great, great drainage. The water, it, it has what's called a, it has a closed cell structure, which means the water just goes right over it, passes right over it, in and out, dries super fast. So it's great for that. Um, I don't use it in my pots for that very reason. It has a closed cell stru structure. So it's not offering, it's not benefiting my plants in any way. And it slowly over time will actually float to the top of the pot, which is like not helpful once it's there, right? If it's at the top, not in with all the roots. Um, and so I use pumice. I use this one, this, this is pumice. <laughs> um, and you can usually get that at actually don't think I've been able to find it at Home Depot, but you can find it at, at like better garden stores, at like garden specific stores. I buy um, my pumice and my soil at American Soil in Richmond. So I know everyone's from all over, but like just do some homework and find out where there's like the closest like landscaping supply if you want to um, do this route. You can totally use just regular old cactus mix, um, pre-mixed, it's usually fine. Um, but like I said, if you're gonna do the cuttings, I would recommend buying your cactus soil and then also mixing in this, this perlite. And I would usually do like a, maybe 40% perlite, 60% cactus mix, depending on like the time of year. Right now it's super hot, obviously, as everyone's experiencing. Um, so things are, you know, and we're about to enter summer. So like I would say do like 40, you could even get away with only adding in like 30%. But if you were gonna to attempt to do this, say in the fall or like early, early spring, I would mix it a little more dry just to, you know, give, your, give yourself higher odds of things not rotting, right? Um, so lava rock is um, generally used more in landscaping, primarily because it looks better mixed with the soil, right? So when you have this white thing mixed with the soil, it's like a little more spotty and, um, and just not, it doesn't look as good. Um, the other reason is it is not full, as, as full of as many nutrients as the pumice is. So it's fine to use in the ground for, to help with the drainage. But the reason I use the pumice in my pots is because in, in a pot, it's just, it's in here. You're not getting like all of the bugs and the, the organic like atmosphere in the soil happening than you do in when things are in pots, right? This is like a kind of like a false ecosystem in this thing. So you want to help it out. So the pumice is full of minerals that succulents love and it has an open cell structure, meaning that the water will actually go through the entire thing, get all those nice minerals out and go into the soil and your, your um, succulents can then be fertilized that way by them. Um, yeah, I think that's it about the soil, um, mixing it, like I said, according to, to what you're planting. So like if there's a, if there's a plant that you have noticed is a little bit more prone to rotting, you could add, you could amend your soil and make it like extra dry so that it doesn't, um, rot. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, we do have a couple of questions. There's one question about using sand. Is that ever used? Hmm. Yeah, you can use sand. 
Um, yeah, that's totally fine. I think if I remember correctly, it's, um, I don't know if it's open or closed, but I think that it's good. It just doesn't have like nutrients or anything, but it's great and helps the water drain better. I wouldn't use a ton just cause it's like heavy and might like compact your roots, but, um, but yeah, you can use that. Okay. And so we have two more that want clarification for the medium and the proportions. So you said you, you'd use about 30 to 40% of the perlite. perlite. And yes. so what about the pumice and the lava rock? What are those? Right. Yeah. Um, so when I'm making mine, I'm, I'm blending it with a hundred percent potting soil. So I usually do about 50, 50 for that when I'm planting regular grown fully rooted plants. And then, and then I shift it again slightly like right, right now. So it depends on your situation, right? Cause like I ha I'm growing tons of plants. I have, ton I have a lot to take care of and keep up with. So I'm wanting to pay as little attention to them as possible. So I'm probably right now gonna give myself a little higher ratio of potting soil to, to pumice just so that they're not drying out quite so fast because all of this heat is going to make them dry out fast too, if that makes sense. Yeah, and how big are those pumice stones? Oh, yes. Um, let me show you. They are, I think it's a like one to three eighths inch. You okay, they're small. Yeah. They're small. You want them to be small, yeah. And that's um, the same with the lava rock is about that size? Yeah, yeah. You can, you can get uh, the lava rock in a finer blend, which um, is fine too for putting in the ground. Um, it, lava rock is also really good for a top dressing because it's, it's beautiful and it helps kind of um, regulate the temperature of the soil and the water a little bit more. Also, people, people have said how they like if, you're, if you use lava rock as a top dressing and you have overhead water, it helps to keep the water from like splashing out and it more evenly disperses and sinks down into the soil, which is and, great for conserving water. And you said you like to use the lava rock outside because it blends in nicer with the landscapes. Yeah, yes. And when you're doing things in ground in your garden, you have all of, you have nice nutrients kind of just there naturally. So you don't have to worry quite as much about getting all these minerals. So that's why the pumice is much better for in pot. Pumice pots, lava rock, ground. Sounds good. We have a couple more questions that might be better towards the end, but the last one relating to stuff you've already covered is when you are um, rooting a new succulent that you talked about, can you put it in too deep? Or is, you know, like, cause you said to put it deep enough, it doesn't flop, but is there yes. a depth that's too deep or? That is a very good question. Yes, um, you don't wanna put any leaves into the soil. Any, any leaves that are touching the soil, I mean, if they're like like a little bit, like with this, if it's like a little bit touching, that's okay. But like, you don't wanna bury any leaves because they're just gonna rot. You want them probably about like that, like level with like right where the leaf system stops. Good question. Okay, and I don't know if any, your audio is cutting out a little bit and I don't know why that is, but. Um... Oh. I don't know if it's the internet connection, but I can hear you again now. So my apologies to anybody. It's just cut out briefly for me a few times, but not, oh, not very long. And you're, you're good now. So okay. uh, we'll keep going and I'll ask you some more questions later after we get through a few more slides. Okay. And then if, and if that happens to just feel free and I'll be happy to repeat. Um, so let me know. Okay. Okay. So here's another way you can do what's called beheading. Um, this is a little bit extreme, but it's totally fine. So you can see this one on the left. I would consider that like a partial beheading because it has pups down underneath. So this is like kind of the opposite of harvesting the pups, right? This is taking off the big mama and exposing all of these new little babies to more light. And it's, and they're still going to be all attached to that main root system and stem. So they're going to still grow nice and quickly. I would actually say like when you can this, depending on the plant, like this is kind of a better way because the ba when babies are attached to the mother, they're gonna grow much faster. So for example, when I took all of these little guys off of an aloe, I probably, these are pretty small. I probably in, in another situation would have waited till they were bigger before I harvested them to have more chances of them having bigger roots like this. 
Um, the reason I took them off was because I was using this aloe for a potted arrangement and the, the mother was like kind of big and tall and I wanted her to be the focus. So instead of burying all of those little babies and having them rot, I took off all the babies, right? And I'm gonna try to grow them that way. But in this situation, I, want, I saw those babies at the bottom, I took the top off and then let that harden off and I, and I propagated that. And I let these continue on attached to the mother. This one on the right was a full beheading, which means you didn't leave anything behind. There's no leaves, there's no nothing. This is a little more extreme, but it, um, I would say like 80 to 90% of the time, you will get new babies growing around the stem of that plant. And when you do this, I just, I leave it in the same place. I let it keep going as normal. I keep watering it as normal, like everything else. And then after, like right now, I, I would say that little guy is a month old, maybe. Things are really growing and happy right now. So if this was in the fall, it might take longer for you to see any action. Sometimes they don't grow and then you give up after, I would say if you don't see anything after a few months, probably give up, but it's worth trying, right? Um, okay, the ever popular leaf propagation, right? I'm sure you guys have all seen beautiful images all over the internet of amazing little things like this. And it's great, it's awesome, but you can't do all succulents, won't, all, not all succulents will propagate this way. You have to be able to detach the leaf nice and clean. Some won't, for example, this, Colantro. I this is actually I forgot to show an example of the root right it's like reaching it was growing into another pot um, so if I want like if I wanted to I could cut this off or like repot this what I would probably do for this is I would repot this and I would speaking of height burying and height of plotting I would actually bury this deeper because this isn't doing any good sitting out here it has a root up here I want this root to be able to be active so I'm gonna repot this all the way up to here and let that root do its thing. Um, but anyway, if I were to pull, my point was, I got sidetracked. <laughs> my point was if I pulled this leaf off, it might grow, but I, I, you could try it. I haven't tried them. I, I've had them laying around and I haven't noticed them rooting. Um, what you wanna do when you do this is you wanna get a nice clean break, like I was saying. So you want, the leaf to be fully intact when you pull that sucker off. Let me see if I can get an example. Oh, here's a good one. So this guy, this is a, a graftocetum, and this is one of the most common, easiest ones to grow from leaves. The, the e a, a trick to, to see if, how to know if they will easily grow is how easily the, the leaf pops off. So this just, super easily it almost snaps off it's like really satisfying you want to see how that's like fully intact um and it's a healthy leaf it's not all like shriveled and sad you want to make sure it's a nice healthy leaf and um and you can propagate those and the, the best way to do it is similar to the cutting tray i use like the same kind of size like a shallow flat nice thing i would make it really nice and dry a nice and dry mixture I've done it where I just lay the leaves flat on top of the soil. A lot of people do that. I, a few months ago, was told this technique though, where, I don't know if you can tell, but the leaf is actually popped down a little bit in the soil, kind of like this. I do it like at an angle, so it's just barely in the soil. The reason for that is I was finding when I would do them laying on the top, the roots would be sticking out, they would start to grow a little, a little succulent, rosette but then you have all these um roots that are kind of still out in the open and then i was going back and tucking the roots in and it took super long it's really like delicate and hard to do so if you just put them in the soil to begin with i was skeptical when i first did this but those little rosettes will pop up through the soil and grow that way and it just kind of removes a step from doing this process um this one, like I said on this, is about eight weeks old for these ones. Again, all succulents are gonna kind of grow at different speeds at different time of year, depending on the weather. Say for example, something in Brisbane might, um, like it's a little cooler, right? 
a um, little more ocean influence. So it's going to grow probably a little bit slower than it would for me in Lafayette where it's hot, hot, hot right now. And it, and it loves that heat. So um, when you water these, it's going to be a little bit different than watering your cuttings. These, I would recommend the best way is to get a spray bottle of water and mist it, like a nice good mist, every couple of days. Um, maybe even every day, depending, like I said, on the weather. And same thing, don't put them in direct sun, kind of baby them. You could do them inside, um, which we're going to get to in things indoors, but basically indoors, generally you're not going to have, it'll probably take longer because you're just not going to have as much sun and you run the risk of them rotting more uh, just because you don't have as much air circulation. Um, okay. And then like when they'll be ready to transfer, I should say, I should go back. See how this leaf is all shriveled and dry? That's when you can pull it off. Um, that's when you know that it's kind of taken all of the nutrient out of that leaf and used it all and it doesn't need it anymore. So you could go ahead and pull that off and I usually wait till they get pretty big to repot them just because, again, I feel like that step, they're still really delicate if they have really tiny leaves. Like, you might as well just, like, let them be, get nice and big before you repot them. So here's an example of a tray of cuttings that my tag fell out. So I don't know how old it is. It's pretty old. Like, I would say maybe even, like, eight months. But these are nice and big. You'll see... This one didn't make it. You're gonna have you're gonna have a lot that don't make it. I would say maybe maybe 25-ish percent. I would say don't make it. So just like check on your tray whenever you see like gross shrivelly ones that aren't you know doing anything. Just pull them, throw them away. I obviously didn't do that for this one, but um, that's the best practice. And I'll pull one of these out, and you can see it's like nice and rooted, ready to go. Um. Any questions about that? We have one question. Do you compost the old succulents that you pull? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I have a uh, like an organic bin, like a, just a garbage can that I use. Um, I also like to tell people I do like, I don't know if people do this when they're cooking, but I have like a bowl for scrap that like while I'm cooking all my uh, organic scrap I put in that bowl and then dump into my compost same on my potting table like I just have this bowl that while I'm repotting something I just have this place I can immediately pull off any dead leaves pop it in there put it in my trash can and then I have a yeah I have a big pile that I dump all of my organic matter and compost. And excellent we have another question and it mm -hmm. says how much leaves should be left so I don't know that question's been there for a few minutes so that oh, might okay Oh, yeah, I kind of answered. You want the entire full leaf. You want a nice clean break. You, um, some people actually to make sure that they get a break, I don't take the time to do this, but you could actually like take a knife, like take a really sharp blade and even cut off some of this stem to make sure that you're really getting the full leaf with it. I don't want to do that because I don't want to damage mama, right? I don't yeah. want to damage the stem. So so usually the reason I have a lot of leaves left over is because I'm making like my wreaths and all of my like decorative stuff. And I always need to create a little, or when I'm propagating, you need to create a stem. And so by, so I guess I didn't really go over that that much, but here's an example of this really awesome crassula. I think this is called the ba like baby necklace or something silly like that. <laughs> but this is a great plant. It needs to be repotted. I have a tag in here. This was potted. I always like to, put tags on things of when I potted them so I know how long they've been in there. Um, just so I can be like, oh, is this, like sometimes you can't tell how, how pot bound it is, which I'll go over, but like, it's just nice to know like, oh yeah, this has been in here for heck a long time, I should repot it. Um, but anyway, so if I was taking a cutting of this, I don't have clippers near me, but I would clip off a piece and then you're gonna, you wanna give yourself a stem. So right, like someone asked about the burying leaves, like you don't, you wanna make sure not to bury the leaves. So what I would do with this, this one, some are easier to take the, the leaves off than others. Crassulas that are stacked like this um, and have woody stems, I've noticed are very delicate. So when you pull off these, I almost like, like fold them. You could also cut them, but I've sometimes like actually accidentally cut the stem. I like kind of fold them and break them and pull them away, right? Just gently, gently, one by one, gently. 
I might be able to do it with this one. I don't know. If, hopefully, you guys can see. I might be able to do it with this one without breaking it off, but that might break off. Okay, so we but have anyway, a couple, very. Couple, couple comments that they're not able to see you, and I don't know on. Um, oh, your, you have. To, I think you. It's in your like your settings for how you're viewing the the class. You should be able to like change your settings. Just see my my screen and yeah. All right, so for Eileen and um, Mildy, if you go to your upper right hand corner, there's a few different views. And so the viewers control the view more so than Jennifer. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like in the top right, maybe there's like little like blocks or it shows like gallery view or speaker view, I think like that. Perfect. Hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Yeah, that helps. Um, yeah, okay, so how are we doing on time? Ooh, okay, so we're getting there. But we yeah. do only have a few more things, so hopefully we can power through. And then so, we will save some time because we have some specific questions, but I think it'd be better for the end. So I let everybody great. know that we'll get to those when okay. we go to the Q&A. And maybe I'll cover it because I want to talk about light and a little more about um, like, like some other things. So, okay. So, okay, so um, contrary to some people's beliefs is um, that succulents want all day sun. While some can handle that, um, if they're mature and they work up to that, most of them really prefer some shade or filtered light, whether that's from a tree nearby or I've even in my nursery um, when I don't have a piece of shade cloth, like you can see, I have shade cloth up. Um, it's like a, you can buy it at diff in different um, percentages. This is like a 30%. So it's just a little bit filtered. It's not too dark. And same within this picture. You can see that right there. See how light's coming through. But anyway, in my nursery and places that I don't have shade cloth up, but I need to kind of protect something, you can like put it next, put something that's more delicate kind of next to something bigger. So in your yard, you can do this too when you're planting something. Like echeverias are generally a little, prefer a little bit more shade or at least some protection and a break. So if you put it next to like a bigger shrub, so at least some of the day, a few hours of the day, it's gonna get a, a break from the sun. It would prefer that. So that's something to consider when you do it. Like, again, this is just general. All succulents are different. They all want different things, but that like, you're going to have better luck if you have a little break from the sun, especially depending on where you are, like where, like, like maybe near, you know, in San Francisco, like Brisbane, maybe areas that are a little bit, like I said, more, um, more ocean influence that aren't getting these crazy 90 degree days and maybe some fog and stuff like that, you could probably get away with that. And they might even prefer being just out full sun because, because of those things, because it's not super hot and because you're getting some just foggy skies anyway. So here's an example of the same plant with different sun exposures. You can see on the left, way more color, kind of awesome. Um, and that's the right amount of sun, right? Like you might want to, you might want to do that. Um, this is often referred to as a stressed plant. Like if you're, if you're talking with a bunch of succulent collectors and level lovers, you might often hear someone say like, Ooh, she gave me this Echeveria that was so beautifully stressed. That's what they're referring to. The stress of the sun kind of can be a cool thing sometimes, as long as it's not too far and you're having things that are burning or dropping leaves or drying out all the time and you're having to water it all the time, right? The whole well, one of the whole purposes and joys of these plants is that they need little maintenance and little water. So you want to try to avoid that. So if you have something in hot, hot sun, watering it all the time, that's, that's not what you want. So you can see on the right, it's like hardly any pink. The center even has this like yellowy, um, yellowy tone to it. Um, yeah, awesome. This is one of my favorites, favorite Echeverias. All fuzzy. Okay. This is something that many succulent beginners often see, and I will guarantee you that 90% of the people who get a plant that looks like this is because you're growing it indoors and it doesn't want to be indoors. Um, it's called atoliation is the technical term, and it's literally the plant reaching for the sun. See how these leaves are actually spaced out like crazy. This is an Echeveria that should be beautiful and compact. And look like a rose, right? So a lot of times people want to grow these inside 
and while this one is outside and a little bit long it's just old um and they get a little long but it's uh yeah they the once the leaves are spaced out you know that that's what it wants is more sun um this can be i mean this so this is like it's not awful the plant isn't going to die it's just not happy and it's telling you that it's not happy also something that can happen once it stretches the stem gets super skinny and it could break and not even be able to support itself. Um, think about also this way that this long stem is just huge distance for all these nutrients to travel. So it's just overall not as he healthy of a plant. Um, so let's talk about things inside. Whoops. Um, most succulents just don't want to be inside. And the reason for that is it's just not quite enough sun. Unless you have like a really nice super bright window that you're getting like, you know, probably end of the day sun and like a lot of hours of sun, that is great. And if, and if it's working for you and this is not happening, great. But generally speaking, you're just, I mean, theoretically, you're only getting a few hours of sun. And then when you're not getting sun, you're not getting sun, right? Whereas outside, like I said, if something was next to something, you're still getting reflected light. There's light filtering in, it's brighter. Um, the other problem with growing things indoors is rot. Um, you don't have nearly the air circulation that you do in, when you're outside. So if you're going to do something inside too, with, it, with that soil conversation we had, mix your succulent mix or like add to your succulent mix and make it more dry. Add more pumice so that you have a less chance of the soil staying, dry, staying wet and rotting your plant. Um, there's examples of ones that do better indoors, the Hawarchia, aloe, I've heard, I haven't done it myself, but I've heard a lot of people have success with aeoniums inside, some provivum, the little hens and chicks, fuzzy guys, a lot of times, and gasteria, and sansevieria. Sansevieria are like epic house plants. I would for sure recommend that everybody has them inside because they're awesome and need very, very little water, and they come in all cool shapes and sizes. Um, oh, the, and the reason that those plants are good indoors is really because they have an extremely slow metabolism, meaning that they grow way slower. So over time, they will demonstrate atoliation. It just takes a lot longer for them to show you those signs, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you want to put your succulent that's been indoors outside, sunburn is a very big thing to be concerned about. Um, these are all different pictures of different plants sunburning. It is permanent. It scars the leaves. It doesn't mean your plant's going to die. It will eventually grow out like this one, like this um, aeonium up here. You can see, oops, you can see the new growth is coming in just fine. You can eventually pull them off if you want. Um, but so when you put your indoor succulents outside or if your succulent has been in a super, super shady place, you want to slowly transition it from being indoors to, or being in shade to sun. So I, I tend to anthropomorphize succulents a lot, but it's kind of helpful, right? Because they're a living thing. And I just think of it like people, like some people that are more pale, if you go out and spend all day at the beach when it's, when you've been in, and it's been, just been winter and you haven't seen the light of day, you're going to burn. But if you slowly do a little more sun each day, you build a tolerance, and you transition and it's fine. Same with succulents. Slowly do it. Um, if you put it outside, maybe put it like against the house, under, a, under an eave, and then just like every couple of days, move it a little more and a little more so that this doesn't happen. Um, okay, so let's go through pests. This uh, is a huge topic. I'm just going to cover the most common ones for succulents. The most common ones that I have myself are mealybugs, aphids, root aphids, fungus, and scale. Um, those are the most common I hear about. The most common that I have is the is aphids, root mealy, and the root aphid. So root aphid looks like this. It's really, it's a real jerk because you don't really know it's there until you pull your succulent out of the pot. This generally is not going to happen in ground pots um, because like I said, you have a better ecosystem in the soil it's a little bit more balanced um, things tend to get bugs when they're not as healthy right so 
it's like you know they go after the bugs go after the weakest link um not always but that's a that's a good sign that like maybe like i actually just found a bunch of mealybug which is this thing here on the right it's disgusting these are what they look like really close up sometimes they're really hard to see because they hang out at the like the contact point between the leaf and the stem so you really have to look for it a really good sign that you have mealy is if for example a beautiful echeveria the new growth is all wacky and like pointy and like getting deformed number one thing i would guess is that it's mealy look and kind of gently peel apart the leaves make sure there's not little white cottony things like this bad bad news um through the way i treat these are i don't like to use pest i don't use any pesticides i don't even really like to use neem oil the reason for that is i find a lot of times it kind of like screws up the coating on succulents it's, it is an oil um, I've even like had it kill plants before or just like burn them. I just haven't had good luck with it. I have the best luck with rubbing alcohol. And what you do is, and I know this is like a lot of information you guys, you can, I, I, yeah, my, hopefully my, um, my website is showing up on there. This is a lot of information. If we don't get to your questions or there's something you forget, please email me or, or um, message me on Instagram. I'd be happy to repeat this. Rubbing alcohol, I do about 50-50 with water in a spray ball bottle. So you dilute it about 50% and then spray it on your succulent. Um, if you spray it full force, it will probably burn your succulents. It's a little bit too intense, but it will still kill the mealy. Um, check it, if you do it, check it every few days for like a week or so, maybe even two weeks, just to make sure that you actually got them all. They're really hard to get. Like I said, pull them kind of apart, make sure you really are getting them and then also like you might not have gotten the babies and then their life cycle, right? You want to like get in all those different life cycles. Um, root aphid, if you do find it, hydrogen peroxide. I was so happy to finally find a, a solution for this. Same thing, but you're going to dilute this even for, further about an, like a one, one to eight ratio. So a bunch of water and just a teeny little bit of the peroxide. Um, you can mix it in a watering can and water or um, you could also, if it's really bad and you find it, I would uh, go to your, your garbage bin, make sure that soil doesn't get anywhere. You don't want it to spread. Take off as much of the gross soil and kind of break them off as much as you can. And then I would, I'll actually soak them in that mixture for a, like an hour or so, maybe even a few hours. And then repot it. And then again, just make sure you check it. Um, Aphids are obviously a jerk right now and they make sticky stuff. They even will leave like a black residue. Um, I don't experience fungus and scale as much, but that's a thing. Just like, you know, pay attention to your plants and look stuff up. It Unfortunately, pests kind of show up differently on all plants. So sometimes you think it's something and it's not. It's a whole, it's a whole big world, but it's something to pay attention to. Question? So we do have some questions, but I was going to see if you have any more slides you want to blaze through and then yeah. we'll go to the general question. Yes. Because <laughs> it's eight now, it's so if we there. blaze through some and oh, if well. attendees can um, wait patiently, we'll do a nice question and answer as soon as um, okay. she gets through a few more. Okay. Um, okay, so rotting, this is examples of rot, um, it, black mushy leaves usually happens when you overwater. Um, this black, the stem is black and the leaves have fallen off. Mushy leaves over here. Basically, mushy leaves equal rot, dry leaves equal not enough water. So those are good signs. Um, you may be able to save your plant if you, if you discover that it's rotted. Um, usually what happens with rot is it starts at the roots and then works its way up. So it will not really show itself sometimes until it's too late. But what you can try to do is Take it out of its pot. Again, these are these are more pot problems. So, like this doesn't happen quite as much in ground, but um, but it can. So you would take it out of the ground or out of your pot, break off all the wet soil, lay it in a um, place out of the sun, let it try to dry out. If it really looks rotten and the stem's mushy, you could try to cut any tissue that still looks healthy and normal, and and do a cutting like we talked about, and try to save it that way. Um, okay, and then oops. Oops, oops, pressing the wrong thing. <laughs> okay, here's an example of something that's, that's pot bound. 
um, which means it's just, um, there, it's overgrown in the pot. There's just no real soil left. Um, you wanna repot that into something bigger. Obviously it's sad. Um, the problem with this is you're gonna be watering it way too much, right? This again, is not really gonna happen in the ground, but um, in a pot, this can happen. Um, succulents need water. Some people are like, oh, you don't have to water it, right? Or I just missed it, right? No, like when you water, fully water, um, a general rule of thumb is once per week, but when you water things in pots, water deeply enough for the water to actually run out the bottom of the pot so that you're sure that all of these roots are actually getting water, not just here, so don't just miss it because that's just gonna be the top layer, right? All of these are gonna suffer and you're not gonna have a healthy plant. Drip systems are by far the best, the best way to water for in-ground. Um, it, you don't have the overspray, you make sure it's going exactly where you want it to go. It's not evaporating off the top, it's not splashing off the top. If you don't have that or if you just don't have that yet, um, you could use a sprinkler if you had to. I always like to tell people every once in a while, if you have, even if you have the best watering system ever, I love to sometimes hand water. It gives you a chance to really connect with your plant and look at it. You know, sometimes we're all in a hurry. You kind of water, you go out and look and say, oh, how pretty. But I find that when you're watering things, you really um, spend time looking at it. Oh, that looks different than it looked like a few weeks ago. You know, you, you might catch a pest that you might not have seen before, those mealybugs. If you're not looking closely, right? So I I like that as kind of like a little one-on-one -on -one time with your plant sometimes is to do it by hand. Um, pruning and fertilizing, kind of rules of thumb, the th things we talked about before when things are overgrown in the pot, um, in ground, if you have things that are kind of like covering each other, that's when you want to prune. Um, people are always like, like, what do I do? Should I take stuff out? It's to It's really up to you mostly of what you think looks good. For this pot, I would recommend taking everything out and putting like half of that back in. When things are in the ground, I would just make sure, it's, it's, a, it's a light situation, right? So if you have something super overshadowing, overshadowing and like kind of strangling, covering something, that thing underneath is in the dark and it's struggling. So clip it away, give the clippings to your friends, propagate them, all that. Um, fertilizer is a thing that people can debate all they want. Um, some people are super into it. Some people are like, why would I need to, to fertilize my succulents? They're used to struggling. They grow in really harsh conditions. Um, but if you're going to do it, uh, these are some cool things. The muku bags, they're, they're cow manure that's been dried and you can kind of steep it and dilute it. Basically, um, anything that has a balanced um, ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So those, if you look at those numbers, it's usually listed on all fertilizers like 10, 10, 10, like just make sure the numbers are all similar. I really like organic, like things like fish emulsion. It stinks, but it's great. You dilute it, you water it in. It's really beneficial for things in pots um, that like I said, don't have the in-ground ecosystem. It helps to create that ecosystem in the pot. Um, is that, and I think that's it. I think we finally reached the end. <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's let the questions roll. I'm sure there's lots. Yes, there are, and you've gotten some good compliments too. People are enjoying the uh, your tips and tricks. Oh, good. So uh, I'm gonna just go through a whole list. Okay. So uh, going back to an earlier section, um, someone said if they put their cuttings in water already, should they take them out and harden them or are they already no. ruined? Ooh, such a good question. No, that's totally fine, don't do that. Basically anything, sorry, I have like mosquitoes. <laughs> um, anything that has an active root system, put it in soil and water it immediately. So like if you're repotting something, um, definitely wa I like to water it, A, to settle the soil and like make sure it's nice and stabilized. And um, any stress that you gave it by repotting it, possibly broken roots, that's, um, that's what you wanna do. So always favor active roots to be put in soil and then to water as normal. Okay. Yes, good question. So um, the other one is how do you rescue the root bound plant like you just showed? What's oh, the yeah. best way? So um, just put it in a bigger pot. You could also um, kind of tease the root system a little bit and like break it apart and loosen it. 
so that those roots are more, you know, they're directed more to, to, to filling the rest of the pot. But um, if you're lazy like me, you could, <laughs> you could totally just put that whole thing in a new pot. I would go with that particular plant. Um, that was a Oscularia deltoides and it grows super fast. So I would actually put it in something maybe like three times the size of that root ball. Whereas another plant that isn't as fast growing, I would probably only double. I, I like, like double is a good rule of thumb for repotting. Double the size. All right, so here's a good question. It's two parts. The first part is which succulents are easiest to grow, but the more important question might be which succulents are frost resistant? Ooh, yes, that is a very good question. Um, these are things that I'm actually just learning because I used to grow everything in Oakland where I basically did not have to even think about anything freezing. So um, things that are more delicate are certain echeverias, um, certain colancho. Honestly, I would say Google it. Like there are certain, I mean, really, cause, and, it, and it really does depend on like how, how frost we're talking, right? So around here, I feel like in the Bay, it's rare for it to get below 32, but even sometimes when things approach like 36, you might get some frost. And um, so yeah, look it up. Like for example, like I had a lot of things that I moved under an overhang. So if you're, if you're worried or like you look at the weather and it's like, oh, it's gonna be super cold night. It might get down frost. Things that are, gen it's generally things that are more water filled are the more susceptible or just more like delicate and like wimpy. So like, for example, a super hybridized Echeveria, like a crazy one that's, you know, all like ruffly and stuff, it might be more delicate than say uh, an Echeveria, like, like the blue common ones that you see everywhere, right? So it really, it, it, you can't kind of say like this whole genus, um, cause a lot of them are different, but like, yeah, I, I would, sorry that I can't answer that more succinctly, but look look it up <laughs> oh i can't hear you shoot so can you say that again bob sorry oh did, could you hear me oh i can hear you now sorry oh, how long do you leave the drip system on when you're irrigating with the drip system oh that's a good question um Again, I think it depends on where you are, the time of year. I feel like it's usually because it's dripping. I'm trying to remember like the most common time. I would say it's probably like a 20 minute cycle um, once a week. Don't okay. quote me on that. It depends on where you are. It depends on how hot it is, right? It depends on your drip system. There's so many different kinds. There's soaker hoses, there's little faucets. It's something you want to kind of like feel out and, and, and that's what I say, what, like pay attention to what your succulent is telling you. If it's dropping leaves, getting crispy leaves, up your water, do it for longer, stuff like that. Okay. And then, so this is leads into the next question. What causes the tips of to brown? Um, if it's the tips, then it's a uh, lack of water. A good way to, a good way to tell when something is dry is um, the tips will usually get dry first. Does that answer that? Okay. Um, um, so we have. Uh, um... Oh shoot! I'm I'm not I'm not hearing you, unfortunately. Crap! I wonder if this is. I have full Wi-Fi, so I'm not sure what's happening. Can you hear me better now or? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, we'll try a few more questions, and if it doesn't work, we will call it the end. We're getting to the end of our questions anyway. Okay. So, um, overwater plants, um, rescuing them, should you try and repot those that aren't too soggy yet, is the question. Um, yeah, right. after you, yeah, after you let it dry out a bit, um, yes, try repotting it. Um, yeah, take it out, get all the wet soil off so it'll like dry faster, right? And then you can go ahead and try to repot it. Unless the stem is just complete mush, then there's no hope. 
but oh. I will, I, I chopped a head off of, um, uh, Haworthia that I once thought was totally gone and I put the pot aside and didn't touch it for months and it grew new pups. So just investigate and, and don't give up. <laughs> and someone just asked, what is a Haworthia? Oh, um, I can grab one. Okay. This. They're the real like lizardy guys. Like I always think they have like really lizardy skin. These are good for indoors because they grow real slow. And they're awesome. And there's different ones. Some have like really white, crazy like zebra stripes. Um, yeah, and some are hybridized with aloe. They're awesome. Yeah. Okay, and so since we're having the connection problems, I'm gonna turn off my video to see if that helps. Someone suggested that. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll read a few more and then if we break up and we have to end the meeting. Um, we still have a lot of attendees on the line, so there's still lots of interest in the questions. So let's okay. the video cool. and keep asking. Awesome, yeah, I'm happy to hang out. Okay, um, um, someone asked if there are any edible succulents. Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, I know aloe is like the first that comes to mind. Not all aloe. Just like people think that all aloe, like they're like just because it's an aloe doesn't mean that it's aloe vera. Aloe vera is a specific aloe species that is good for your skin. There are others that are okay, but um, yeah, that's the only one that I know of. So I know that you can eat aloe vera and like okay. use it as a drink, right? But that's the only one that I'm aware of. So we have two questions that are real similar. One is, I have some old succulents that are tall and leggy. How do I rejuvenate them? And the other one is, how do you handle a big mom, quote unquote, on a long stem? So those sounded similar. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so just like we talked about before, I would behead it because it's not going to shrink, right? And if it's long and ugly and skinny, I would just, um, I would chop it. So like similar to this, right? This is what I would call a bigger mom that it's like not, it's looking kind of funky. And it ha look, it has little babies, right? So I would actually chop it. It has a baby growing from the stem. I would chop it here. I would pluck up all these leaves. I would propagate the leaves and I would stick the mom in a cutting tray. Excellent. Um, yeah. Um, and then somebody, now I'm gonna get into a few specific questions that came in early. Okay. So Sharon, if you're still with us, how do you propagate variegated bear's paws? Oh yeah. Um, those are amazing. And I'm actually uh, struggling with mine a little bit. They're, I can't figure out quite what they want. Um, you, try, same way. Um, let them harden off. They're, I would maybe do them on their own separately so you can like really make sure that you're not overwatering. But, but they should propagate just like, just like everything else. Um, I, a good rule of thumb too with variegated things, everybody, um, is they will generally want more shade than its normal counterpart, right? Because the reason is, is it's A, really hybridized to look that way. It's not natural, usually not naturally occurring that way. And um, because it has less pigment in the leaves, it actually photosynthesizes more slowly. So you don't want it out in the sun. It's just like a general, generally more delicate of a plant. So yeah, so the, the bear paw is just gonna be a little more finicky. You might lose some, but just, just keep trying. It will propagate. <laughs> Darn it, can't hear you, Bob. Oh, the root dried out and no success. Is okay. Okay, I heard the end of that. Can you repeat one more time? Sorry. They have tried to root blue chalk sticks. They put it in potting soil, but the roots dried out and had no success. Is it too little water? And they yeah. are watered once a week. Interesting. And, or is the it... soil, they asked. And what? They said, is it too little water or is the soil not right? They watered about once a week. Um, maybe the soil's not right because chalk sticks are really hardy. Um, they do like a decent amount of, they could, they could do a little more sun. Um, but if you're doing a cutting, you want to reduce the sun, right? Um, but those, I 
propagate those really easily. I've even done those straight into their own pot with like a big long stem. So I'm not sure. Um, if I mean, if you're saying the roots are actually drying out and getting crispy, then it's not enough water. Whatever problem you're having, if the soil is currently dry when you're seeing that problem, it's probably too much water. And if it looks sad and the soil is dry, then it's probably not enough water, right? Yeah. Excellent. So we still have a lot of attendees and we have one last question, but it might be good for everybody. So um, the last question is, what plants do you recommend for beginners? Oh, good question. Aeonium. That was the first one I ever uh, propagated and that thing roots so easily. It's so forgiving. Grows like a weed. Um, what else? Crassula. Um, the Crassula is a big genus, but there are like the common jade, you'll see that one's super hardy. Um, I have, where's my big guy? This one is super awesome. This is a, a Crassula also. This ogre ear, he's super great. Those, he will propagate really easily, he's really forgiving. Um, doesn't, doesn't tend to uh, rot too easily, doesn't tend to dry out too easily. Crassula, ones like this. That, that look like this that are in that jade-esque are, are really good and, and easy. Um, also these guys, the Graptocetums, Graptivaria hybrids, those are good. All right, well that's the end of our questions and um, yeah we had a lot of compliments come in on the Q&A so I think oh. everyone got a lot of great information and if anyone else has a question I don't don't see any more coming in. So, okay, good, I'm glad. So remember, um, someone had asked earlier and I typed it in, but um, you're available at westwindsucculents.com. Yes, exactly. And my email's on there, which is just westwindsucculents at Gmail. Um, Instagram, I'm usually pretty attentive on. I'll see those messages. Um, send me pictures. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to help when I can. I'm, and I am starting to do, I was doing a lot of like crafty art classes with succulents before shelter in place and I am starting to do um, virtual ones. I've done a couple and they're really fun. So I'll like mail you all your materials and then we can do, you can like get some friends together and we can work that out if you want to schedule that. Um, but yeah, I'm available. Let me know if you need anything and thank you so much everybody. Oh, excellent. We just had another half a dozen or more compliments come in. So great oh. class, Jennifer. Yay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Have have fun with your new uh, your new knowledge. Yeah, and share uh, share 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 succulents with your friends. They're the best the best way to do it. Yeah, I, I concur. All right. <laughs> okay. The comments are still rolling in, but everyone have a good night and have fun. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much for Hi, having Jennifer. me. Absolutely, M my pleasure.